Hello, everybody. Let's check that you can hear me. Hear me? Oh, reverb. Everybody can hear me okay? Good. Okay, so that off, and uh, yeah, cool to see quite a, well, quite a few people here. That's nice. Ninety three to start off with. Way. So um, yeah, today I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction into um, improvisation on a very basic level, really. I mean, I'll probably touch on a few things that are a little bit more advanced, but. Uh, um, I talked about this last week in the live stream over at the website. Uh, I was mentioning that um, I might do that, and I kind of give a little bit of a demonstration because somebody was asking about it. So I wanted to do something about it where I can actually play a, a backing track. In fact, actually, let me know if you can hear that. I've just got a basic minor 7 chord there. Let me know if you can hear that with... <laughs> with that with that over the top good so um so yeah so that's what we're going to be doing and um before i do that just a few little while we uh, while a few more people arrive um there's an uh, spring stroke easter sale over at talking bay so if anybody's looking to get one of the courses on the cheap there's 30% discount on all of that, so that went live yesterday. So uh, that's going to be that's going to be on over this coming week or two. So uh, yeah, so if you like any of this stuff that because I'm gonna I'm gonna get into a little bit of chord tone stuff and a little bit of scalar things, um, uh, particularly the chord tone stuff. If you like all the chord tone stuff and you want to learn more, um, then there's the chord tone essentials course over there, which is like a deep dive into the whole thing. So you'll learn a, how to how to create every every chord you're ever going to see. Uh, I don't mean chords like playing chords, like... I don't mean like that, I mean arpeggios. So you learn the arpeggios, i.e. the chord tones, of every chord you will ever see. So um, I also show you how to apply them to the bass, and how to apply them in music and... Blah, 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 blah. So that's the Chords on Essentials course. There's also the reading course, uh, which is massive. That's like 25 hours of video and 700 pages of lesson material. So there's that. Uh, scale Essentials. And if you do want to learn about chords, then there's the chord, uh, Chords for Bass Guitar um, course over there. There's also the, the beginner courses as well. So that's all there. Oh, and the Technique Builder course, where we do a lot of technique stuff. So... All of that stuff's over there at the website. That's on sale, so I thought I'd get that out of the way. So there's that. Um, what other stuff? Um, hopefully you've all seen the video that I released yesterday of good old... Uh... Nice bit of stew ham uh, that I've covered on there. So I've uh, that's the country music uh, night in hell. Ugh, got an itch under my under there. Uh, that's uh, I've ju I've just gone through that. So the uh, the first uh, that was probably the, one of the first tapping things I ever did on bass as a because it's so easy. I mean, there's there's just that. <laughs> it sounds really cool. Um, and there were, yeah, a few things like that. All those kind of uh, fairly simple kind of lines. Uh, I was really into that stuff back in the 90s. And uh, I was really into Stu Ham. Slap, pop, and tap for vi uh, for bass video. That was just like a game changer for me. I saw that, I'd, you know, I'd been learning. I was a metalhead. I was learning like Megadeth and Metallica and Anthrax and Pantera things. So about 1991, something like that. And then... Um, Along comes that VHS video that I put in, and that was the first thing. You know, you see him going. No. You know, 
country music thing. So I uh, I saw that and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> that's unbelievable. And then I got the Billy Sheehan one and that th threw me for six even more. So uh, so I was into all that stuff. I'm not anymore. I don't do anything like that. I can't tap for you know my, save my life anymore. But it's uh, I was really into it back then. So, um, yeah, so if you're into that kind of stuff, if you think, oh, that sounds kind of funky, just watch that video I released yesterday. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, oh, we've got 140 people in. Things are, <laughs> things are happening. Uh, let's see what we've got in here. Um, uh, da, 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 Martin Trump from Phoenix. Richard from Boston. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through everybody. <laughs> Diego, Glenn... Yeah, some of the old favourites like Glenn there. Um, I think Ellen's in. So, yeah, Ellen's in. That's good. Ellen O'Reilly. If any of you don't know um, or haven't seen Ellen yet, she's... Uh, if you've seen any of the vi uh, the interview videos like Tony Levin, all that, that's Ellen that does that. So she's now the community manager in the uh, forums and stuff on Talking Base. So um, say hi to Ellen. Uh, she's here. And Dortmund, there's Pascal, Aiden from Cork. Yeah, Aiden's been in before. There's Russ, Russell Burnham, he's, he's in a lot. It's funny, you get to know, even though there's tons of, uh, <laughs> of names, you, you get to know the ones that are here all the time. Hello from South Carolina, that's David. Uh, da, da, da. Rob from the Netherlands. Oh, everyone's saying hi to Ellen. <laughs> uh, cool, we've got 130 in here. So Jay says, uh, Cod's on Essentials is great. I'm trying to get past sounding like I'm playing exercises when I try to improvise. Yeah. Um, so this will give you a little bit of application with that. I'm just waiting for a few more people to get in because it's we've only just gone live. So I, I like to wait around just for a few minutes just... Because otherwise, you know what happens, everybody starts watching it, uh, they come along late, and then it's like, oh, can you just uh, uh, talk about this thing? And, and it just so happens I talked about it right at the beginning. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm not going to move that quick with this improvisation thing, but the opening bit that I'm going to talk about is actually one of the most important parts. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that anyway. So, so improvisation, what is it? Well... It's just making stuff up, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's uh, creating melodies on the fly. So uh, it's basically so it's basically composition, right? So, but I suppose you could call it that. But another way to look at it is that it's uh, like speaking, pretty much. It's a conversation. So, especially in a live setting, it's going to be a conversation with other instruments. It's, you're creating stuff, creating music on the fly. That's improvisation. And I remember when I was at uh, music college. Um, you know, I, I'd been learning like bass lines. You know, I was I was into metal stuff. You know, but I was into classical things as well. And I was I wasn't that much into jazz, but I listened to you know, bluesy things and stuff. And so, I, you know, I had heard people improvising uh, and I was getting heavily into Frank Zappa at the time. So I did hear of quite a bit of improvisation. But, you know, I, I'd go to, um, we'd, we'd have improvisation classes and we'd have like uh, these ensemble classes where we'd have to basically improvise. So we'd be play, playing through like some basic jazz standards like Blue Bosser and Autumn Leaves and those kind of things. And um, I just remember not having a clue you know, it was like it was bad enough when I was doing walking bass lines when I began, when I got started, but I had no clue where to get started with the, um, you know, with the just improvising a solo. You know, I'd be playing the bass line and then you know it'd get to my turn and I'd have to play this solo and you know I'm going just after a sax player and a pianist and stuff and I just felt stupid, you know, because I'd just be basically playing root notes over whatever the chords were. I just didn't know what to do. So I needed some way of kind of learning how to do this stuff. And I kept asking people, you know, for tips and especially sax players. And they'd always sort of give me, you know, Abersold books and things like that. And they give me like arpeggios to learn and modes to learn. And But that doesn't really do anything. You know, like if you say to someone, OK, what are you going to play over a D minor 7 chord, and then somebody says, oh, use a Dorian over that, use a D Dorian. Okay, well, what's a D Dorian? 
<laughs> you think, oh, okay, I've got a Dorian. Well, what are you going to do with it? You know, th th I mean, th I mean, seriously, what are you going to do with it? Go up and down it. I mean, you could do, you could do that. I suppose that actually doesn't sound too bad, uh, but it's a bit dull. Um, and then. You know, over a G7. You know, what we're going to do over a G7? Oh, well, that's a Mixolydian scale. Okay, we've got a D minus 7 and a G7. Oh, okay, so I can play. And then we get to C major 7. Oh, you can play a C major scale. Or somebody that's really hip might say, oh, you can play a Lydian scale. And you think, well, what am I supposed to do with it? It's just you know, scales, they don't really mean anything. And then somebody else might say, oh, no, no. You don't want to be playing scales, you want to play arpeggios. Okay, well, what's the arpeggio for D minus seven? There's a D minus seven, and here's a G seven, and here's a C major seven, so you end up with this. Which I suppose is something, but again, it's not really making music, is it? So that's not really improvising, you're just reeling off a bunch of patterns, scales, you know. And that's not what improvisation is. Really, what you need is uh, is to develop a vocabulary, uh, which, you know, you could say is learning licks. Well, there is an element of that. But also, you develop a kind of uh, awareness of what certain, of what all of those notes that are in those scales and those arpeggios, what they sound like over a particular chord. Because you can play the same scale, you can play a Dorian scale over you know, a bunch of different chords, and it'll sort of work. But every time you do that, depending on what the chord is, those notes within that scale are going to sound completely different, you know, depending on what the chord is. So it's all relative to the chords, right? So a couple of little things that you need to know, just as preliminary sort of primer kind of things, is that when you're looking at chords, when somebody says there's a chord that you're going to play over, let's forget about chord progressions. Really, if you can't play over one chord, then you're going to be you're going to be knackered when you've got to play over a bunch of different chords. So if you're just going to be playing over one chord, right? So just, I'll use minor seven as the example. So because I've got a, a little track lined up there with a minor seven because it's a pretty easy one to play over actually. So so if you've got a, a C minor seven, let's say a C minor seven. Well, what does that mean? What have we got there? Well, it doesn't really tell us anything apart from what the notes are in the chord. You know, I mean, the key is going to be important there, but let's say it's just a chord, C minor seven. What can I play over a C minor seven? It's all in the chord tones because that's the information you've been given. So, so there's first things first, you need to know your arpeggios. You need to know, you need to know a C minor seven for playing over a C minor 7 chord, you need to know the notes of a C minor 7 chord. So you need to know the arpeggio, right? So that's your first That's your first port of call. Now, beyond that, somebody might say, oh, well, you need to know scales so you can sort of connect them up. Don't worry about that for now. One thing you need to know about that arpeggio, those chord tones, is that why do they work over the chord? Because then the notes of the chord, they're in that chord. That might sound really obvious, but... One of the really important things that you need to know about that is um, is how tension and release works. The fact that any note against that chord is going to have a certain color and a certain vibe and a certain sound. And really, that's connected to um, tension and release, resolution, and um, consonance and dissonance. Now, that sounds kind of complicated when you, dis when you describe it like that. But just think, if you've got a C minor 7 chord and then you play a C. Well, that's the root note of the chord, it's in there. It plays nice because there's a C in the chord. E flat over that C minor seven. It plays nice because there's an E flat in the chord. They're consonant, you know, they're playing together. Think of a, a open string and a fretted G, two Gs together. They're playing nice, aren't they? That's nice and consonant. That's ultimate consonant. But then all I've got to do is move that, one of those Gs to an F sharp. And it doesn't play as nice. There's consonants and there's dissonance. So those chord tones work because they're consonant, okay? Everything else is going to be dissonant to some level, right? So I'm just going to play a, a C minor seven. And if I play the notes of, a, of, the, of that arpeggio there, we're playing fairly high up so we're not just sounding too uh, 
boomy down here. So C, the actual root note of that. This is C minor seven. So the notes of that chord are C, E flat, and G, and B flat. So root is C, third, the minor third there is E flat, G is the fifth, and B flat is the seventh. Okay, so the C, when we just play that on its own. Here it plays nice. And if I was to play, uh, let's say, an A flat there, on its own, it doesn't play as nice, right? But G, okay? Okay, so the G's in the chord, the C's in the chord, the E flat's in the chord, they all work nice. Just playing through them really slowly so you can absorb what that, what the, each one sounds like. Okay, so th those notes are consonant. Now, that A flat sounds quite dissonant, doesn't it? But then it resolves. Now, that's another thing to bear in mind. Now, when you put it in a line like that, it doesn't sound too dissonant, does it? Here it is on its own. <laughs> there you go. And now... C, B flat, A flat, G. The A flat's in there. Because it's in passing. And because we're resolving it. You can put anything in as long as you resolve it. <laughs> there you go. What's one of the most dissonant things you can get is going to be a C sharp or a D flat. As long as you resolve it. Okay. So... So that's the first thing to note, that chord tones work because they're the notes in the chord. They are consonant. Everything else is kind of up for debate. Now, there's going to be things that are going to contextually going to influence that, you know, like if you're in a key, like if that was C minor 7 and you're in B flat, the notes of the B flat major scale or the B flat key are going to influence that. If you're trying to do a modal thing that's in a, a you know, a Phrygian scale, you know, that, that kind of that uh, kind of Spanish kind of sound, that little minor seventh thing, that's all modal. So you could also think in terms of a natural minor scale. There we've got the A flat into the G, F, E flat. Or maybe Dorian. And there we've got the major sixth. Again, each one of them's got their own character. There's a major sixth in there. If that was uh, an A flat, that would be natural minor. I'd put a flat second on it. And all of a sudden we've got we've got that Phrygian sound. So the modality of it, that's all a separate thing. But first things first, we've got to think about chord tones because they they always work. So like I said, uh, and by the way, I will uh, I will come back to looking at the um, comments in a minute, but I'm just sort of on a roll with this and I don't want to get distracted. So again, what I'm going to do, uh, and I, uh, what I'll do is I'll put these, uh, I'll put, uh, I think, I've, I, I don't know if I've got these, these uh, chords on the website. I will put them up on a page. I'll make a page for these and I will put it, I'll put a link below. I've not done it yet. I should have done that before, shouldn't I? But uh, what I'll do is I'll put these things up. Um, how far are we through this? I don't know where the damn... can't see how far in we are. Um, so there's a C minor 7 chord. Remember what I said. This is a C, E flat, G, B flat. So what you can do is just play around on each chord tone to begin with, just getting used to it and just playing around with chord tones. It's going to be a little bit boring at first, but you know, you just need to try creating some kind of melody. And also, just before I do that, what are we thinking about when we think about improvisation? Because on the face of it, you know, I've given I get, once again, I've given you a bunch of notes that you can play there. There's a little palette, but what do you do with them? Well, the only if you take that arpeggio, right, that chord, what makes that music? What turns that into a melody? Well, it's rhythm. 
Without rhythm, that's just a bunch of notes in stasis. To put it into some kind of four-dimensional time space, we're going to have to use rhythm. And it's rhythm that's going to decide on what the, the, ele that, that element of the phrase is, phrase is going to be key. Because you can make a melody up with one note. So if I just take that C. It was rhythm that turned it into a melody. It went from being a single note to being a melody just with rhythm. So rhythm becomes your friend with all of this stuff. And it's that that makes a, a phrase, well, that makes a phrase. Um, so in creating phrases and melodies and analyzing them, because let's face it, once you want to build up a, a vocabulary and you want to learn all the cool little licks, you're going to be looking at them rhythmically. You're going to be you're going to be looking at the notes. But it's funny how rhythm actually becomes such a massive um, uh, thing in terms of well everything. You think about the difference between speech, right? Okay, so speech uh, with the way that we all talk and converse, often it's rhythm that is a defining characteristic in that because, like, I mean, my voice has its own characteristics tonally because of my you know my physic physiology right but in terms of the actual notes coming out yeah there's the words that i say you could say that the words are tantamount to actually playing notes but the actual rhythm the way that you speak the way that i'm the way that i'm speaking now the way that i'm speaking now if i was to put a i mean what tempo am i talking at so a tempo like that you can hear the rhythm of it going on there you can hear the rhythm of it going on there you can hear the rhythm of it going on there, and you can hear where the cadences are when I'm talking and I want to come to an end of a certain sentence. It'll probably come down onto it now. So the rhythm is a defining part of how we speak, and it's a defining part of what a, uh, of what a phrase is, right? So um, I'm hoping this is making sense so far, right? So like I said, you can take a, a chord like this, don't know how long I've only got it for a certain amount of minutes so let's let's see so um oh in fact let me start it again right there we go so try individual chord tones just creating rhythms up with them so maybe add a bit of vibrato something to make it a little bit more expressive bit of dynamics all of those things so going down the Dave Gilmore route here, aren't I? Then try maybe the seventh. So that was the C. So let's go to the minus seven. So that's B flat. Very boring, I know, but I'm getting to hear what that, where that wants to go, that it wants to come back to that C. So because the seventh has its own amount of disson uh, its own dissonance in there, even though it is in the the actual uh, chord okay so there i've made up a phrase let's try the fifth the, the g again here it's that's a different sound to and then g e flat there's the third the third and the seventh are often the character notes in a chord so and then just branch out and you can start trying combinations of those notes maybe two notes at a time there you go two notes gives us a phrase there maybe try a question and answer so there i've gone c e flat g I'm landing on the fifth there root third root two little phrases here how different it is when i land on the fifth and that again is a really important point okay so anatomy of a phrase right so think about what a phrase is okay what's it built of it's got a beginning a middle and an end you've got the beginning the start which is a note right so let's take one of those that I just played. So, uh, oh, let's 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 just take something straightforward. So, just playing up through the uh, minor seven. Okay, that works as a phrase, doesn't it? 
So we've got a beginning, we've got the C, I'm sta the starting point. We have the end point, that cadence there on the B flat, the final note. And then we've got something in between. So I've just gone up through the arpeggios. So the E flat and the G are in between. But every phrase is going to have a first note, it's going to have a final note, and it's going to have a bunch of stuff in the middle, right? Now, one of the things that's important to know is that that final note is going to carry a lot of the flavor and character of the, uh, of the, of the actual phrase. So if I play, okay, that last note there, that B flat, keep that in your head. If I came up from the G, low G here, let's say I come down from the top, <laughs> okay, wherever I am, so, <laughs> it doesn't matter what I play, I could play anything, <laughs> you drop back in on that at the end, like, See what I mean? That final note has a lot of the character in there. The first note doesn't really have that much. I mean, it's not to say those other notes aren't important, but, you know, you know, especially if you're hanging on it. And even if, even if I just let it, you know, if I just play it quick, you can hear that that's still a very important note. Okay, so you can hear that final note in each melody. Each time that note, that final note, gives uh, carries a lot of the flavour. So this is how you create these lines. You 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 have a set of, like a little palette you can work with, which you know, in, on the most basic level, you know, when you're looking at a chord, it's the chord tones, and then you start to think of what a phrase is. So like I said, even if it's just two notes. That phrase there, G, B flat, G, right? There's a start note, the, the G. There's the B flat, and then back to the G. So fifth, seventh, fifth. Try little combinations of chord tones. And another thing, in, uh, another important part of this is that you want to be playing around the neck. Don't just get locked in into this little box shape here. Try expanding out. And don't worry about doing it all in one go. Oh, I've got to move all the way down here and all the way up here. No, take a little box shape like that. Check out what the notes are. You want to be thinking notes. Go down below. Okay, maybe move down in a position. Move up a bit. Like I've said before about um, about finding your way around the neck, when you first get started, you have these little box patterns or, the, or even just a little selection of notes. And um, oh, I just noticed that the blooming video stopped for a second. Um, you'll have this little area that you kind of stick with, right? And I compare it with being dropped on a desert island. So, I mean, I've come up with this analogy before, but, you know, it's like lost or something like that, or castaway. You get dr dumped on some island, you know, and you all you've got is the beach. And there's not much to the island, but, you know, you've got your beach and you know where everything is. You've got your wood over there. You've got the little fire that you've made. You've got your, you know, all the stuff that you that you had from the ship that's just sank somewhere out there. And you've got all, you've got all this stuff here and you found out there's some, uh, you know, like sort of a little bit of food that you've found back there in a tree. You know, you've ventured out a little bit, but you don't want to go too far because you don't know if there's going to be some horrible animals that might, uh, that might uh, you know, kill you. And then you uh, go find some fruit and stuff like that. And then gradually over a period of time, you would you know, that map that you have would broaden and widen and you'd feel a little bit safer going over there. I can see, you know, Skull Mountain over there. Eventually you get over there and you <laughs> look over there and there's there's a waterfall over there, but a bit, you know, I didn't really want to go there at first, but now I'm fine and I know my way back, I know my way over there. And that is what it's like with the, with the, uh, with learning the fretboard. You know, so you start here. <laughs> just got this little area and then all you need to do is just add that B and uh, sorry B flat and G below maybe move into the next position down move up a bit down here you can shift from here Oops. 
Okay, so you you start to just branch out and figure ways of of moving from you know like one place to another. Okay, so that's core tones. So let's just have another listen to them and see what we've uh, what we can do with just sticking with core tones and staying and and start branching out. Okay, so you want to start looking at ways that you can maneuver around the arpeggio. So. <laughs> Like I said, there's that fifth, there's the final cadence note that I just played. And if you want to have a question and answer thing, you could play one. Or let's say. Okay, so I'm just staying in this position for now. B flat and the C there. Thinking rhythmically, you know, and this, to be fair, there's no drums here, so I'm just having to kind of make something up. That wasn't a very good phrase. And then start moving down, so. Like I said, there's. If you think in terms of individual phrases, etc. So, so that's chord tones. You can just mess around, just you know, playing various chord tones and getting used to what they sound like, what they sound like when you cadence, you know, when you finish the phrase on a particular note. So, so that's chord tones. So, you know, you play around with those for a while and it doesn't matter what the chord is, you know, if you were to try major seven, you'd, you know, you'd want to use a major seven if you, uh, if it was dominant seven, you could use that. So the next thing you need to do is start looking at non-chord tones. So these are those little dissonances. And this is where scalar movement comes in, because that's pretty much all the scale is. It's a bunch of chord tones connected by, um, <laughs> by scale notes. All I could think there was like thigh bones, thigh bones connected to the hip bone. Um, so you've got... Um, so let's not look at it just as a, just as a scale. Look at it as chord tones, they're your framework, they're the notes that work, and everything else around it is going to be used in some way to connect them or approach them or, you know, whatever it is. For now, you know, there's multiple ways that you can do any of this stuff, uh, but at the moment we're just adding these things slowly. So, so let's look at uh, those notes of the C minor 7 again. C, E flat, G, B flat. So what could we use to connect the C and the E flat? Well, the most obvious one is a D, right? Let's stick with natural notes, right? So we've got the root note and then use a major second to link it to the minor third. Okay. Then from the E flat to the G, the minor third to the fifth, but what do we need to put in there? We need to put a fourth in. Are we going to put a augmented fourth in? No, just put in a perfect fourth. So I'm just connecting the E flat and the G. Okay, so this is what you would call a passing tone, or passing note. Then from the G up to the B flat, what note have we got in between there? We've got an A of some kind. Do we want an A flat or do we want an A natural? Well, let's stick with the major, um, which gives us that sound. You could use the, we could use that, but for now we'll stick with this A. What do we get when we add all of those together? C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat, C. That's a Dorian scale. So that's pretty much what a Dorian scale is. It's just a minor seven chord with those natural or, or you know, major, major second, a, a perfect fourth, and a major sixth in there. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. Now, oh, before I do that, what I'm going to do here is stick with the same kind of thing that I just did, where I was just hanging around on chord tones, um, which are basically just consonant all the time and I'm just going to start adding them in as little melodic devices now you might hear me say melodic device quite a few times on the YouTube channel and when I do uh, what I'm talking about is uh, either passing 
notes, like I mentioned there, so a note that connects two of them. So in between E flat and G, I could have the F, here presto, a passing note. It's passing between them. Or you can have neighbor notes. So, so there's C up to the D and back. So we play to it and back. Or sometimes you can just have an approach note where it just comes out of nowhere. Where you just, yeah, you just come in out of nowhere. Uh, you can also have enclosures where you have two neighbor notes, one either side. So. so you can see how this is getting more into that melodic construction kind of uh, idea. But one thing that this is really good for is... Um, is, is improvising when you don't want any of that... Um, oh, forget that. Have you ever tried improvising with a scale over a chord and found that you just end up landing on bum notes, even though you're using a scale that's supposed to be correct? And you'll see guitarists do this a lot. A lot of rock guitarists, they'll, they'll know that there's a... Especially if it's over something like a minor seven or something like that, uh, because they're so used to playing pentatonics. But if you say to them, okay, play a Dorian scale, improvising a Dorian scale over a minor seven, and they start whipping out a load of licks, but sometimes they'll land on, you know, like, bum notes so in terms of i'll tell you what i mean by that so you might just go up and down like landing on the fourth and not actually intended to i mean actually it sounds okay but but that might not be what they're actually intending you know you can tell that sometimes that a phrase i mean i, I kind of worked it so that it works there for some reason but like you can you'll sometimes hear it happening or you'll do it yourself and you think ah oh, that's not the note i wanted and that's because you're not thinking of chord tones, because chord tones, like I said, are the basic consonant notes in the chord. So if you approach scales more as chord tones with passing notes and neighbor notes, approach them as notes around this chord tone framework, it will make a big difference because then you're not going to have these bum notes. Now, that's not to say that they are going to definitely be bum notes because there is a way of using them, which I'll come to in a sec. So... To begin with, try using scales like that. So if you take a Dorian scale, you look at it as that minus seven with passing notes in there. So let's see what some of them sound like. So you could make a phrase up easily using these. So if I just play here on, all of a sudden, the phrases are starting to sound a little bit more fluid. So, and a little bit more uh, cohe uh, cohesive. Because the stepwise, the stepwise motion going on, they don't feel as angular. You know, when you're playing up through, it, it's all very angular. So, when you play scales, it's all stepwise. So, using them as passing notes, let's try C, uh, C, D, E flat. So, that there, I'm playing the C up to the E flat chord tones, but I'm connecting them with a passing note of the D. Maybe come there uh, up and back. And you don't really have to start thinking all the time of, oh, I'm using passing notes, I'm using neighbor notes. It's just a way of practicing, just getting used to connecting these, uh, these chord tones. Really what you're thinking is chord tones and just connecting them in some way or approaching them in some way. Okay, so that is a melody in itself. E flat to the G. Again, little melody. Let's try G up to the B flat with the A in there. There I came when I came down, I dropped down to the F to as a little neighbor note as well. And then let's try some enclosures. So that was from below and then above. Let's try from above and then below. Oops. I told you that I'd run out. <laughs> that was when I ran out onto the next chord. Okay, so each time we're working around the chord tones. So this is how to use chord tones in your improvisation, just trying to make up melodies. Like I said, you can also think of this as... Um, 
uh, as vocabulary, you know, you'll ha listen to soloists, take their phrases, take their licks, analyze those, see what they're doing, and then you'll take that all on board, okay? So, again, that was just a simple phrase that I created. Starting on the fifth, working up to the root, putting in a little passing note, so. I'm just making random melodies here. Again, you could think of those as, as a, you know, a scale, a scalar sequence, but really... Really, I'm thinking chord tones, still, but with these things around them, you know, connecting them. Neighbor notes, let's, let's have a see what they sound like. So, just a, a chord tone and then a, a note either side, so... And by using combinations of all these things and, you know, looking at how other people use melodies, you'll start to see how they... You know, you're connecting them over longer periods, so... So, yeah. So that's melodic devices. That's passing notes, neighbor notes, enclosures, how you can start adding those into this framework that you've got. And remember what we started out with. It was just the chord and then just looking at the individual ones and rhythmically trying to come up with something. And as you gradually build up with this thing, you don't have to, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot better than somebody just saying to you, oh, use a Dorian scale. Bingo, you know, improvise. Here's a Mixolydian, here's a Spanish Frisian. You know, Lydian, you know, Lydian dominant. It's like, huh? What are you supposed to do with that? It's just a bunch of notes. When you can see it as chord tones with this, you know, as a framework and then all of these other things around it, all of a sudden you can start making melodies that are a lot more, well, melodic. <laughs> you know, even something like that that I played. You know, it's dead. That's just a really straightforward thing to just come out with. And I just improvised that on the spot. I thought, ah, oh, that's an okay melody, isn't it? And how, and how you rhythmically uh, go at that. You know, you can play around with the rhythm and all of that stuff. Look at the picture. It's starting to go funny. Let me just check something. Yeah, the game went up. That's playing. You just have to stick with it, right? So, um... So yeah, so that's uh, that's that's chord tones. Now another thing that you can do. Oh god, I look so bad with this now. The gains just jumped up for some reason on the on um, on X split. Let me get back a bit so that I don't look as washed out. Uh, so the other thing. Oh god, look at that. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that you can do is um, is start looking at those non chord tones in there, not as melodic devices, but as extensions of the chord. So. <laughs> So when you actually highlight one of those things like that, uh, that D, the, the, so the second degree of the scale, so the ninth, right? That minor seven that we're playing over there, you can start to use these things as extensions like the ninth, the eleventh, and the thirteenth. So, and each one of those has their own character. So let's have a listen to what they sound like. So the ninth, for instance. There, there's the 13th, that's the A. Okay, so that's the 13th and the 9th, which kind of work okay when you're landing on them, because remember what I said before, in passing, you can kind of get away with anything. You know, you could, each of those notes, you know, chromatic notes in there, each of those notes 
on their own might not work. But... So, uh, the, the A there, the, the 13th or the 6th of the... When I cadence on it, or when I land on it and highlight it, accent it... You can hear how it's got that characteristic vibe, and those notes, the ninth, uh, those extensions, those things around the, uh, the actual arpeggio, are the characteristic scale steps on a mode. So, that there, that A, is one of the characteristic scale steps of a Dorian. It's one of the deciding factors. If you're playing through over that minor 7 with a natural minor scale... hear how that's got a lot more of a minor vibe. It's a lot more uh, melancholy, so. Okay, that's a natural minor scale. If I use a Frisian, we've got that Spanish vibe going on, so. That's the minor second and the A on the Dorian that major sixth is the um, is the correct uh, characteristic step there along with the ninth and if you want to kind of outline a mode or play real modally you really want to outline those characteristic scale steps okay that's that's Dorian right so that's natural minor if you were using a harmonic minor So that's, that's, you know, that's how you outline and uh, play around with these modes. Um, also, Dorian, so let's say we're on here, so you get that very, that's, that's that funk kind of sound. So when I talk about Dorian, you know, with that, that characteristic scale step, damn reverb, you know, that, that kind of sound. That's the Dorian vibe. Major six, so the major six in there. So, so that's all I'm doing there. I'm just highlighting various extensions, okay? So, so we've gone now from absolute basics of just playing a single chord tone in isolation to combinations of those um, chord tones while creating uh, phrases, then to uh, adding scales via, you know, uh, the... Um, passing notes and let's just have a listen to that again with uh so the you know using the passing notes and all of that stuff if we were going to use the a flat so the the natural minor so so there that a flat there it is so if I was to start on the fifth there, so. Hard to land on the A flat. It really, because of that uh, half step there, it really wants to, you know, uh, resolve on the G, so. That's natural minor. So. We've now got to uh, those non-chord tones. Let's have a look at something else that you could add in there, just as a little bit of a, uh, a of, as an extra thing. And, and bear in mind, I'm not moving into chord progressions in this lesson at the moment. This is just getting used to, because uh, it's for beginners, basically. I mean, it's just getting used to playing, making phrases, making sounds over a particular chord type. Because you want to try this with a minor seven, you want to try it with a major seven, try it with a dominant seven, just so you get to know what those notes are like. Then, once you start looking at actual chord progressions, you can start targeting notes in the next chord. So if you're on, let's say, D minor. Let's say you just, here we go, D minor 7, G7. So, I mean, it's very... About as basic a line as you can possibly imagine. But what I'm doing there is playing up, up the minor seven, and then targeting the third of of G seven. So there we are on G seven. Okay. So that's the next step on from that. But at first, all we're doing is just looking at creating 
material, just with using the resources that we've got and just creating stuff, just trying to get creative with it. So another thing that you can do over uh, a chord uh, in creating these lines is actually look at the individual arpeggios um, from that scale. So if we're looking at, let's say, that, that Dorian scale, instead of just using the, the arpeggio movement, the movement uh, by leap uh, on a C minor 7, you can actually start looking at all of the all of the other arpeggios that are within that scale. So um, if you think about um, C7, C, sorry, C minor 7, that C Dorian as being, you know, it's basically B flat major, but we're using C as, as our tonic. So that's this is what we're resolving to. Um, if you look at all the arpeggios that are wi uh, within that B flat major scale, you can use those as well. So as well as C uh, minus 7, we could use D minus 7. You could use E flat major 7, F7 there. And uh, we can obviously also drop to where am I? <laughs> and we can also drop down to the um, B flat major, obviously. Uh, we've got the A minus seven flat five. So let's have a listen to what some of those arpeggios are like. And as a tip, when you're practicing those, try resolving them after you've played them. Okay? So I'll show you what I mean. So here's just the C minus seven. <laughs> Now I could try adding a D minor seven in there because that's the next arpeggio up in that uh, Dorian scale. See what I mean? It's got a different sound. Those those notes are all in that in that Dorian scale, but we've started on that D. Okay, so we've got that, and that's why I say try resolving it. So. Hear how different that was. So up the D minor, and then come down that C minor, and it resolves. So that's nice. Another. That's just another way of creating a phrase. Let's try the B flat major seven on the other side. So. So that was that was the B flat major seven. Let's try A minus seven flat five uh, flat five arpeggio. Half diminished. When you land on the A uh, there, doing that, it it does sound a little bit odd. You know, you've got that, but. flat major seven basically what that gives you is your minor seven uh sorry a minor nine arpeggio so okay so that's just another thing that you can do just to get some resources to add into these phrases that you're creating and just as you do this it's just more and more stuff that starts coming to you another thing that you could try is some intervals within there so Instead of just playing, you know, either just seconds, as in going scalar, or by thirds, which is arpeggios, you can also use things like fourths. So if we listen to what that sounds like. So all I'm doing here is taking a Dorian scale and I'm just building fourths in it using the notes. So only the notes of that Dorian. an odd one actually on the second one i'm just stacking fifths there so again that gives you a different kind of sound but remember what i said earlier that final note in the phrase is going to carry a lot of the character there you go character of that phrase doesn't matter what you call 
comes before it, that note's going to carry a lot of the character. So, um, so there's that. And then finally, another thing that you can do is start adding chromatics in there. So if you want to add chromatics, think of chromatic notes in the same way that you looked at these, these uh, passing notes and neighbor notes that I talk about. So again, see the chord tones as the framework. And just as you used the scale notes to connect those you can use chromatic notes in the same way. So it's just on a, a more microscopic level. So if I was to, let's say, play E flat, F, G, that's third, fourth, fifth, let's just add some chromatic notes in there. So let's add the F sharp in there. Maybe up here as well, A, B flat, B natural, C. Okay, as long as you're landing on a note that works that's how the blues works the blues scale the blues scale you know people always talk about the blues scale as being a scale i don't class that as a scale at all all that is is a minor seven with a chromatic passing note because you can't really do much with that blues note in terms of creating harmony or any of that stuff it's not an integral part of the actual scale it's always used as a melodic device you either use it in passing or as a neighbor note like that okay so you can add chromatics like that so if we're going to try that using exactly the same principle again so we've just got our basic chord tones See there, I just root major seven minor seven, but I'm landing on the minor seven, which is chord tone. Whoops. So. That uh, that I said with the E flat, F, F sharp, G. I'm just adding them in around there, so. There with that one. That's a there's a flat second in there, but because it's in passing, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I mean, when you do that, I mean, the other chromatic way to work is by playing outside. When you can use sides, uh, little side slips and things like that. So instead of just so that was in a bad place there but again drifting uh, well moving out and, dr uh, and dr well, drifting out and drifting back in right so you've got so i'm playing the c minor seven and then i'm just playing a c sharp minor seven just playing it a half step up and then just coming back in can do it with anything. I mean, you could take fourths. As long as you resolve it at the end. So, there... So that's just a bunch of different ways that you are of creating content to actually work on these phrases. And remember, it started simply with playing the chord tones. I mean, what did we have at the start? We just had this. You know, just learning what they sound like. There you go, you've resolved. I'm on C. That's the root note, okay? I mean, the last thing you want to do is keep landing on C. It just gets really repetitive and boring. See what I mean? So landing on the third, for instance, has a little bit more colour to it. There you go, there's that major six that I talked about, that's more colour. That's the ninth. Okay, so I'm trying to keep it really, really, you know, in one area so you can kind of see what's going on there but just to give you some ideas of things that you can try because like i said 
Um, first time I ever tried it, and not that I'm a great improviser, but the f first time I ever had to do it, I just did not know what to do. And it's all about creating these phrases. And, you know, I mean, that's just creating phrases. That's not actually working on, uh, that's not licks. Uh, the next step really is to actually listen to a lot of improvisers, you know, listen to uh, jazz improvisers and things like that and listen to what they do. Um, and hear how they, what they play over certain chords and then work them out and then add them in or listen to blues players, listen to what they do, um, analyze melodies. You know, I mean, let's face it, sax players, keyboard players, guitarists, they've all got one up on bass players when we try playing melodically because they play melodies all the time. So, you know, a sax player, that's all they do. That's all they do, they play melodies. So there's a bass player when all we sit there, you know, most of the time, we're always uh, just sat there going, oh. we're not used to playing up here, you know, whizzing around playing melodies or even just playing, you know, we're not used to phrasing melodies, adding vibrato, working out how to play with the time and all that. Uh, that and I don't mean play around metric modulation. I just mean, you know, playing in a rubato fashion just playing allowing the time to move around because bass players become so set in that kind of metronomic rhythmic uh, pocket kind of thing where we're always thinking just dun, 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 dun. Uh, let's make sure that we're all in time and that we're grooving with the drums and everything but when you play melodies and playing solos you don't want that you want to un unless you want to obviously <laughs> you know if you're going to be sat there going you know, as like a solo or something. But um, but most of the time when you're playing melodies, you want the opposite of that. So everybody else has a, has a bit of a, a leg up in that sense uh, that we don't have. So, um, yeah, so that that's that's it for improvisation. That's just a few things that I wanted to mention because, I, you know, I, I, I think that... Um, I mean, also, one thing worth mentioning is that... Um, a lot of bass players will be like, "Meh, why do I need to learn to do any of that stuff? You know, I just want to, I just want to groove, man." Which, is, yes, exactly. But one thing that you'll learn from actually learning to play melodies and improvise melodies and stuff like that is that your ear will improve massively because you'll know what all you'll be really listening to what all of these chord tones are, how they're used. You know, you're creating music on the fly. So when you want to work out a bass line, you want to create a bass line, all you're doing then is what you were doing that was, you know, with your melody, just in a low register in time. You know, so it it has massive, massive um, upsides and benefits for your playing. Just from from every... You, you don't have to learn how to be John Coltrane. It's, it's, it's about just actually learning how to... How these notes... Uh, how they work over a chord, how chord tones, what that B flat sounds like over a over a C minor seven, what a B natural sounds like over a C major seven, what a D sounds like over a C major seven, just how these notes interact and how they feel, most importantly, over a, a chord. And it's all about ear training and developing a, you know, a vocabulary. Okay, so. Um, so yeah, so that's that's it for the improvisation bit. Um, I won't be too much longer. So what I'll do is I'll just go up and have a see if there's any questions. So from now I'll just I'll just take some questions just before I go. I'm burning up here. I've got <laughs> I had this heater on earlier on, and I'm just like, oh. um, I'm glad the co the the backing track works as well. So remember, like I said, there's the um, there's the spring Easter sale on over at Talking Bass. So if you do want to get a course, and I cover all this stuff, the Courts on Essentials, I cover this stuff in depth. Um, is uh, that that's all? There's they're all on sale, discount thirty percent at the moment. So get on over there and grab yourself a bargain. Jack says technique builder for bass is a great course. Thanks a lot. Thanks for giving the great demo on Machine Gun Triplets last week. I've since bought the Stuart Clayton's Ultimate Slapbook, which is great. Yep, Stuart Clayton's great. Uh, the thing that I did yesterday, the good old... <laughs> so...
So that is uh, that Stu Ham thing is actually. Um, I mean, I learned it in about what 1992. But the uh, the book, uh, you can get that. That's Stuart Clayton, Baseline Publishing. It's fantastic. It's got all of that stuff in there. You can learn all of that. All the good old. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that's that's out at the moment, and that's really good, and that's one of the reasons that I did that video. Um, uh, uh, what bass is that? Uh, what this? Enfield Lionheart. So it does look wicked, doesn't it? I mean, the paint job on it is fantastic. I mean, it's uh, it changes depending on the angle. Like a UAP stroke UFO. <laughs> um, if you haven't checked out Martin Sims Supercore Pickups yep Martin Sims he creates all this it's amazing um, you are the bee's knees my man that's good that's good uh, just bezzing down through all of these the um, comments don't we all get to you if you have not mentioned it in a sec are you using reverb delay chorus just reverb i've just got my zoom b3 that i use for uh slamming into into here oh, nothing there and then this is just uh what is it whole reverb so completely messed up because uh, and it's worth mentioning it's good uh, a good segue the um uh, I'm, I'm currently filming i've been doing it all day so i've got rosy red cheeks um uh, the new study piece course so I've, the next course that i'm releasing will be at the beginning of next month uh, and it's basically that piece notice how that's down the octave so what i've done is i've taken it down the octave i've moved a few notes around uh just so that i can um you know uh so that everybody that's got a you know 20 fret four string bass can play it because normally you would have to play this up here and it it reaches a G at the end. Uh, so now I've made it so that you can play the whole thing here, so that at the end... So it all fits down there, so that's good. You'd have had to have played that up there. <laughs> this bass needs sorting out. The, those, those frets are dead. So it's the G up there at the, what's that, 20, 20 second fret. It needs fret stoning really badly. Um, yeah, so that's going to be the next course. So it's going to be a study piece thing. So um, I guide you through it step by step. So first of all, first lesson. <laughs> And you do the, we work through those. I give you uh, tips on uh, how to apply a, a, something like a cello suite to a bass, how to read it, how to um, play the, well, how to get through all the technical problems. And we break down the harmony because in the harmony there, you've got that chord, then that chord, then, then that chord, and then. You know, that, that's what's being outlined. So we work through the harmony as well. So that's coming out next month. Um, da, da, da. Patera, um, last month I had been started playing bass and you helped me to improve skill so much. Get in. <laughs> um, okay, right. So this is where a lot of the other stuff comes in. Looking at, um, ch -ch -ch. 
uh, Goose says, um, and the Blues, Matt, where players play a 12 bar and play all seventh chords, but play minor pentatonic or even major. Am I right about this? Um, well, uh, think chord tones. I mean, that's the easiest way to go about it because if you're playing, you know, I mean, you can use just pentaton uh, pentatonics and you can use just the blue scale over the top, but but don't try soloing over it uh, like that if all of the other instruments drop out unless you really know where you are, because what happens is that... lose where you are when in fact if you play through the chord tones and I'm not gonna play a melody here let's just play the arpeggio you can actually outline the arpeggios so chord tones are your friend with all of that and then like I said with the other stuff you can you can start adding in uh Chromatic notes, you know, that's all that is. I mean, it's like this. So on the F7 for a for a, uh, a blues, I'm just filling in the gaps, basically. And then look at the note that you're landing on, because if you don't want it to sound too cheesy and always... <laughs> landing on the root note all the time. Try landing on the seventh. Or the third. You can hear there that it's got that sound, hasn't it? You know, just by itself. Instead of just thinking blues scale. You know, it's, it, it's always the same with that because you've just got that, just that 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 blues note all the time, and it just gets so repetitive. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, does it make sense that chord tone melodies sounded like Pink Floyd uh, and scale melodies sound like Dire Straits? Well, not really. I mean, it depends on the style. I mean, it just so happens I was playing over that. You know, so everything's going to... Well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Over that, you've either got a choice, haven't you? It's Pink Floyd or Dire Straits. Sting's going to pipe up in a sec over the top of it with money for nothing. Or you're going to have, like, some random... I mean, any any Pink Floyd tune, pretty much. Um... Over a 251, could you play a minor or major pentatonic? Would it sound hip? Well, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, it's a minor pentatonic. I mean, you can t transform any scale into a minor pentatonic, uh, into a pentatonic, sorry. Uh, so over a 251, you could play a D minor pentatonic. And then a, a major pentatonic on the G. And over a C major, do that. I know what you're what you're actually getting at though i think you're trying to say would you because you're instead of looking at individual chords you're thinking can you use a single major pentatonic over the whole thing well yeah you probably could but if there's no chords going on and everything else drops out you're not going to be able to outline the harmony in the same way that's the problem for bass players a lot of the time everybody else drops out and you've kind of got to outline the harmony uh uh, Mark, do you have any favourite band in a box styles that you use in your videos? I've tried to find something like that you used in chord tones, one to seven, but can't find anything close. Now this is just I just basically sequined up a pad chord. <laughs> it's a bong. It's like record bong for like you know three minutes. Oh, I know which ones you mean. Do you mean like the the ones with the ding dick ding ding chicka dick ding dick? Um, I can't remember. It was a band in a box one. That one. Um, I probably wouldn't use band in a box now. They're really good. I mean, if you get band in a box, you can get loads of uh, different cool uh, styles to play along to. But uh, I think in future ones, I'll probably get um, um, some 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 better quality backing tracks done. Um. 
hey Mark, I sent you a message on the Talking Best app. I want to perform one of your transposed pieces at a competition, but I need your consent because it's like a legal thing. Oh, actually, I did spot that. Sorry, I didn't get back to you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, there's, there's no problem with that at all. In fact, send me another message and I'll do a full reply to it. I'm a guitar player who doesn't own a bass and I'm just enjoying watching this. That's good. It's because of my um, comical face, I guess. Uh, best course for learning improv. Um, Chord tone essentials at mine, but I mean, um, I don't do an improv one there yet. That's one. I might do an introduction to improvisation covering this stuff that I've done. Hold on, the video. Oh, the video went funny again. I might do. I might do an impro a basic improvisation one. If for an, an advanced one, I'd like to get a masterclass done by some real top notch guy. Um, you know, because it's it's one thing me showing the basics and that, but if it was me and I was watching um, uh, something, you know, if I was going to buy a course like that on advanced things, just as when I was at at, at music college, you know, when you go to university or whatever. You know, all the tutors might be brilliant, but you really look forward to a lot of the outside people coming in. Like uh, we had McCoy Tyner come in and do a, a master class. Um, and, you know, you watch a guy like that and, you know, it's a complete world away from watching just any of the tutors, even if the tutors are amazing. You know, you, so I want to have some guys like Jeff Berlin or Hadrian Faro or someone like that, you know, Matt Garrison, some real top notch guy or Yannick Wisdala. Um, to do a, um, a like an advanced masterclass, a sh you know, it wouldn't be long like my stupid courses are, you know, like mine are ridiculously long, but, um, you know, have something where there's somebody really, really top of the tree doing it instead of a schmuck like me. That rhymed as well. Uh, would you recommend vocalizing solos? I wish the yes. Yeah, because you want to be able to do... It's good for your ear as well. But really, you want to be able to sing it out. So as you're playing something... I mean, I'm terrible at singing. I, I know what they're going to be when they come out. I'm not, I'm not randomly playing, you know. Each of those notes, you want to know what it is as it comes out. And, and by singing along with it, that can really help. Uh, were you shooting video earlier? Yes, I was. That's why I'm wearing the black thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the uh, prelude that I'm doing. Could you do a Friday YouTube on how you transcribe uh, bass lines with you writing notes out on staff paper, uh, maybe four bars, your process? Uh, I mean, that is basically all there is to it. I just have a pen and paper. I never do it onto onto a computer unless I'm really, really tight for time and, and, and you know, I've got to get it out at the same time because I am pretty fast with um, uh, notation packages. But the uh, the best way is just with a pen. You know, I can rub things out and, you know, a pencil. Pencil, ideally. Uh, and then I just scroll it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just every if you look at anybody's transcriptions, it always looks awful. Uh, Matt, you said you were going to put some notes up. No, I didn't mean notes. Um, I've I've got them. It, it was just the tracks that I meant. Um, although I mean, I could, there wasn't really much I could. Well, I could have done something about this, but I I have just improvised all of that. It wasn't um, scripted, um, so I've basically just done all that from memory. So I wouldn't have. Um, I could have done it i suppose i could have scripted it like i you know and planned it like i do a friday lesson but basically what you've just seen is me make a lot of stuff up <laughs> on the fly how to make things more elastic and improve technique just plain just plain i mean there's my technique builder course uh but it is i, I hate to wreck everybody's um i hate to you know maybe not answer it the way you'd like, but it is literally just from playing over a long period of time. It's not like I've sat there going, you know, to, to make my hands stretchy and stuff. A lot of that's technique. Uh, you know, if I don't have to, I won't stretch. I mean, I've got fairly a fairly good stretch, to be honest, but I don't ever use it. Like if I'm playing, like if I'm on stage and I'm playing something and let's say it's just, let, let's say it's this, right? Let's turn that reverb off. You know, the, the most basic bass line you could ever play. I'm not thinking one finger per fret. I'm not even thinking thumb in the back of the neck. I know it's 
sacrilege to say this, you know, to some, you know, because some people don't like you mentioning bad technique because it, it I mean, end of the day, it's, well, bad technique's, it's not bad technique, but like, I might be sat like that with my thumb over there. Look at that hand. I mean, this would be the correct way to do it, like, thumb in the back. Hands nicely spread, but uh, fingers nice and curled. But man, if I'm on stage playing some thing like that, <laughs> I don't really care. Now, if I'm playing something like this, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, that kind of. Oh, sorry, that, uh, was that right? completely forgotten the thing um but if i'm playing something like that then yeah i'm going to be a lot more on it in terms of the actual you know like arpeggio movement especially you're going to be a lot more on it in terms of the actual spreading of the hands and things but most of the time i just don't bother and a lot of that the just the general dexterity of the fingers it just comes from playing just playing a lot and playing quite lightly to be fair like I, I, in that last Jeff Berlin, um, oof, in that last Berlin, uh, Jeff Berlin interview I did, I was talking about how, because the conversation was about uh, playing lightly and and just you know, not pushing, you know, hand exercises and all this kind of stuff, and. You know, I used to try playing the Black Page by Frank Zappa, and there was a really difficult part in the middle. I don't ask me to play it. I can't remember the, the middle bit. But um, uh, anybody that's heard it, it's like... Oh. You saw the Black Page, right? And in the middle, there's this... Doo -doo 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 thing. And I used to sit there practicing it, practicing it, trying to get it down. It was like, ah, oh, man, playing to a metronome. Doo -doo, speed it up slowly. And all I did was hurt my hand. It's like my finger-picking hand. I got, like, tendonitis, like, really bad because I was pushing and pushing and pushing. And then I mentioned it in that interview. I ended up doing... The, I got asked to do this cruise gig. It was, like, right at the start when I was doing that, those cruises. And um, we were just playing ballroom. That's all we were doing. So, it was like, waltzes, foxtrots, quick steps, you know, tangos, all that stuff. And uh, we did... Uh, a lot of them were, like, waltzes and stuff. But really, really sedate playing, you know moon river and we're just doing all that hardly touching anything but because i was playing so much like every day just hours and hours and hours every day i came back from there and i was able to play that black page thing it was like you know all that pushing and pushing and pushing I, all it did was injure me but playing a lot playing lightly and playing um just being consistent with your playing makes a much much bigger difference and also playing things that you can't play. You know, always pushing in that sense. Pushing to try and play stuff that you can't play. Um, um, like that leather bass strap, what model is it? This is a Levy's Leathers. So a 4.5 inch strap. Uh, Join late. My understanding is the video will be available on your site. It'll actually be available on YouTube. It's just gone live on YouTube, so, you know, you'll be able to find it here on the channel. But I will put an embedded version in the Talking Bass Live page over at the site. Um, yes, best process for transcribing lines. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, it's just a case of listening and learning. I've got the ear training course where I do actually have a full lesson all about transcription. And like I said, spring Easter sale at the moment, 30% discount on all courses. Um, thanks, Craig. I listen to a piece of classical music, and this is one of the pieces I want to learn. Yep, so that'll be coming out soon. Um, da, 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 da. so last few questions. If you've got any questions, to uh, I'll be going within the next few minutes. So if you really need to ask me something, um, you better ask it. Uh, I have a question about pentatonics. I noticed that major and minor pentatonics have the same pattern. So what is the actual difference between the major and minor pentatonic? They don't have the same pattern at all. Um, one of them is a mode of the other, I suppose you could say. But this is where you've got to get into chord tones and understand about um, the chord that you're playing over and understand resolution and uh, consonance and dissonance. Because if you're playing... Yeah, I mean, you could say that if I play, um, let's say... Uh, uh, yeah, C minor pentatonic. And then you say, okay, uh, well, that's the same as the... 
the E flat major pentatonic. Yeah, it's the same notes, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. Because if you're playing over, uh, if a perfect example, let's do the C, mi C minor again, right? C minor seven. So over the top of that, C minor pentatonic. Okay, so there's a minor pentatonic. Okay, so what have we got there? We've got the root note relative to the chord, right? Root note, third, there's a fourth in there, there's a passing note up to the fifth, flat seven. So it's just a minus seven arpeggio with a fourth in there as a passing note. Yes, you can use the E flat major pentatonic, but think about what that is. So we've got the E flat, then the F, Okay, for the first two notes, then we've got that G there, so we're actually, you know, it's the same B flat, C and E flat in a different place. When you play, even though it's the same succession of notes, the root note is an E flat. The third of that pentatonic is the fifth of the chord. The fifth of the E flat major pentatonic is going to be the seventh of the chord. And then the, again, the um, so blah, blah, blah. you get up to this top bit the root note again is the E flat so even though it does have the same notes in there the actual position of them relative to the chord is different and that's where it can start being problematic now from you know decent improvisers that doesn't matter they can use any of those things and and it won't matter but if you're trying to get used to playing over a certain chord you really need to be aware of where you are relative to those chord tones if you're using e flat as your tonic basis of that then you're not thinking of c as the tonic right now that you can use that to your advantage but as a beginner it's not a good idea. You really want to know about what the actual chord tones are and what they sound like relative to it, rather than superimposing other things. Uh, Hi, Matt. Do you know of any app software where I can play a song on CD and, for example, separate instruments, vocals to play along with the actual recording? There is one, and I can't remember what it's called now. Um, there's, there is one, and I just can't remember the name. Uh, but it, it's not perfect no, none of them are perfect favorite bassist just by their appearance clothing style oh i thought you meant me i thought you meant i was your favorite bassist based on my appearance and clothing style but you mean what's my favorite bassist just by their appearance and clothing style don't know bootsy uh the woodlands versus Katie. yeah yeah we're um i've put in the application for the visa so it's all going ahead um at the moment i'm temp i'm more on the woodland side than i am the katie side there is a place called firethorn in katie that i absolutely adore but um uh yeah i really like the woodlands although where i'm going to be there i don't know uh, creekside park is possibly the place i just love the uh, market street and the you know the mall there woodlands mall i just love all that uh is there a lesson package that covers all courses no there isn't um partly because it's always it's always increasing uh i'm always adding courses so it wouldn't that wouldn't really work and it'd be hella expensive as well i use my pinky finger a good amount in a three fret span is that good or bad uh no i that's how i do that's how i play most of the time like that the only time i'll use uh four uh, one finger per fret is when when it's uh, the most efficient way to do something so obviously on a, a c natural minor scale that's the most efficient way to play i always look for the most efficient way to play whatever it is i'm playing uh da, da, da. right okay last few here um uh, really uh, teaching style thank you uh when you come into texas would dig buying you a beer i was there a few weeks ago um well about a month ago checking it out because i am coming over to uh um, we're probably moving to Houston. Um, yeah, seeing pentatonics as box patterns is... Anybody just seen scales or arpeggios even as box patterns, you're missing out on a lot. Because I'll tell you what happens when you look at it as a box pattern. You see this. And what can you do with that? Well, you can do things with it, but it's all within one octave. But... You, 
you don't even have the notes below it. You know, if you play it on C there at the third fret of the A string, you've still got the B flat and the G below it. But that's that's what people normally see when they do them. You know, you want to be able to move around so that as you're up here. You want to be able to move around the neck with it, not, you know, you don't want to be stuck in this box. All right, everybody, that's it. I'm getting crazy groin strain sat here, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really glad that you all came. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, remember, like I said, 30% off at the uh, at the website. So we've got, uh, so just get on over to the shop there. You'll see all the courses are there. Um, so 30% off on everything. So if you want, if you like the way that I teach and the way that I've just presented all this, then check it out because that's what all the courses are. And they're huge. You've got like the reading course is 25 hours of video content. So if you really like watching it, you can watch that to your heart's content. If you don't like how I teach, then don't bother. All right, then, everybody. Lovely to see you. And I will see you again, uh, hopefully, quite soon. See ya.